Welcome to We Love the Hype, a podcast about advertising and PR from me, college lecturer Molly Wilkins. This podcast serves as a supplement for my classes, but is also open to the public with interviews and conversations that I hope will have engaging, enlightening, and entertaining stories about our industry. If you hear some weird noise in the background, you may notice that I am recording this just outside of a middle school football game. This is called Working Single Mom Life. But today's interview is with my dear friend, Dylan Floyd, who recently had a career change. And I'll announce that at the end of the show. It's a pretty big one. She's got a fantastic story, and I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. Let's go. Dylan, thank you so much for being willing to talk with me today. Um, for for those who don't know, I have known Dylan since you were in high school, I guess. Yeah, I think so. That's and of course, I know you because your mom is fabulous and owns a local restaurant here in Macon. For those who don't know, it's grow and it's amazing and it's always a winner. So go check it out if you're in town. But um, so we were chatting before I hit record a little a little bit about what you're doing now. And I was basically saying that I didn't I knew that you had switched jobs, but didn't really realize what you were doing. And I know you can't talk a whole lot about it. But I guess tell us the name of the company and a little bit about what you do and, and I guess kind of why it's a little, I don't, know, I don't know if secretive is really the word, but, you know, there's some confidentiality there. Yeah. Senior consultant at Ernst & Young, also known as EY. I am all, part of the consulting side of the business, so you might know them, you know, for tax and accounting things, but I work on the consulting side. Primarily, my skill set there is product management, customer experience, um, doing really like offline and online activations for our clients um, to kind of help them, you know, rethink the way they may have been doing things in the past. And so because I uh, primarily work with my clients, I am under an NDA for most of the things that I do, Um, but I'm happy to share my experience and anything that I can. Well, you know, and it's funny because um, I've heard of Ernst Young. I know it's financial sector, and it's fascinating to know that that's where you are, because from what I know about your background, you know, what you did in college, you know, all the media experience you've got, the social media work, I would have never thought that that would lead to working at Ernst Young, you know, a financial company. And not necessarily in a direct media role. So maybe uh, let's start out kind of backtracking. What was it that you did in college? Since a lot of people listening are are my students, (laughs) Um, but others may not be students as well. So what did you start out doing? Yeah, when I started out at UGA, I was actually a political science major and I stepped into the first political science class and they said, you're going to have to read 200 pages worth of information every day and then take a quiz every class. And I said, this is not it. I got to find something else. Like, this is not going to work for me. And by the way, you're no dummy. I mean, you went through the International Baccalaureate Program at Central, right? I mean, you're you're smart. I was the number one mock trial lawyer in the state (laughs) in high school as well. Oh, my God. (laughs) Yeah, like, I, I really thought I wanted to do law. But something, once I started the actual classes themselves, something just told me, like, this is not where my passion is. Like, yeah. this is something that maybe I'll be good at, but it's not what's going to get me out of bed in the morning. And it's definitely not going to get me out of the bed in the morning to take a quiz at 8 a.m. every day. <laughs> Ew. Um, so, you know, I kind of took a step back and I looked at all the other things that I was interested in. And, of course, because my mom owns a restaurant, my first thought was, I want to own a restaurant, too. Like, maybe I need to pivot to a business career because that's what my mom did. She's a really successful entrepreneur. So that's what I should try to do, too. And so I transferred over to Terry, which is the College of Business at UGA. Mm -hmm. I chose digital marketing as my major. And while I was in that program, I met a mentor who really changed the course of my entire life. Um, She... Uh, at the time was working for this boutique consulting company and she really opened me up to this whole field of jobs that I didn't even know existed in consulting. So I um, finished out my capstone project with her and then she immediately hired me on to come on as an intern for uh, their marketing team. 
So I did a lot of B2B marketing for them, but I also got to listen really closely to what consultants do. And I was just so fascinated by like the customer experience um, projects that I was on or the, um, you know, like big marketing strategy developments that we were doing. And so I started to think, you know, maybe I need a little more experience on the brand side to figure out all the different teams that I possibly could work with. Mm -hmm. So then after I worked at that consulting firm for about three years, I went over to Home Depot to try my hand at a little more of the hands-on keyboard media stuff. And that was really where I started to learn, like, budgeting, forecasting, planning, agency management, all those things that, you know, are really, really important, not just to marketing skills, but pretty much any job that you're going to have. Um, and then, you know, eventually after working at Home Depot for a couple of years, I said, you know, I really learned so much working in consulting because you have so much exposure to different industries, different clients. I, I want to go back and I think there's still more for me to learn. It was pretty much either go back and get an MBA or <laughs> go to consulting so I could keep learning. And so that's how I ended up where I am now. And that's, you know, what's amazing to me about that is, and I'll, I'll kind of backtrack just a little bit more again, when you were in college, you, you worked for the Red and Black too, right? Yeah, so I started off for the, so I, you know, waited tables, I did the restaurant thing my first couple of years of school, um, but I started to look around for like marketing related internships. Mm-hmm. And the only thing that I found on campus was handing out newspapers for the red and black. So I would literally stand in the middle of the plaza and try to hand out 2,000 newspapers to people on a Friday. And that turned into uh, me working in their office. I was selling classified ads for a newspaper, which if you guys can imagine, like it wasn't like 1980, okay? It was like 2000. It was like 2015. People weren't really looking at classified ads. So it was a really tough job. Shout out to all the folks who do sales. That is like the hardest job in the world. Sales is, is it's hard. It is really hard. It's so hard. I re- and that's how I kind of realized, I was like, I think I'm going to cross sales off my list. I don't think that's part, that's not the marketing path that I'm going to take. Um, so then I got more into like the creative writing and blogging side. So of course I did some of that with you, which was so yeah, fun. Yeah, that is <laughs> <laughs> yep, I forgot I about that. <laughs> some of those articles, that was awesome. And then I also worked for the Athens CVB. So they do a lot of the PR for Athens, like encouraging uh, tourism and things like that. So I would write articles about the best places to eat, the best, um, you know, shops to shop at, all that good stuff. Uh, so, so yeah, that's I've had, really like, cool. pretty much all of the experiences. <laughs> so, you know, what's interesting about that, gosh, I, how did I forget that you wrote for my website? My God. Um, wow, that feels like forever ago. Um, but, it, you know, I think what's neat about this, too, is you've got this marketing background. You were in the business school, but yet you were also crossing over into media and writing and even advertising sales so you had a foot in both worlds and and I think sometimes students get this message of you know you have to do marketing or you have to do PR and really you got it you had experience in both do you think that was helpful for you Yeah, absolutely, because I still use creative writing skills every day. Like, even though my job is not to be the person who writes the copy that goes out um, to customers, let's say, I still have to write a lot for the business stakeholders Mm. that I talk to. So I I tell stories still, um, but I, I do it in a different way. So, you know, when I look back on my career, I really think about, like, all the skills that I was able to gain, not just, like, what industry I was in or what the actual role was itself. Yeah, no, I love that you said storytelling because I'm so big on storytelling, 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 because you I think a lot of people don't realize that you do use it in like B2B communications or even internal communications. Um, you know, you use it in so many different places. I mean, I heard that a lot even when I was getting my master's degree. Um, so going back even to Home Depot, were, were you there during COVID? Yes. So I started at Home Depot in July of 2019. Ooh. And so, yeah, so back then I was, I was commuting into the office full time an hour, both ways in Atlanta traffic. I, uh, you know, had my whole team in the office all the time. And I will never forget the day that 
I looked around in the office. It was March of 2020. Hmm. And I said to my coworker, like, no one is here. Everyone is gone. And I was like, have you heard about this COVID stuff? I think it's a big deal. They canceled March Madness. And she was like, do you think we should go home? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I think we should. And then that day, they sent an email saying, no one come back to the office. Uh, you're all working remotely now. And I did that for about two more years. So yeah, I mean, wow. it was a really crazy time to be in home improvement, as you can imagine, because everyone was trapped inside their homes. So, you know, there was lots of stuff happening at Home Depot. Uh, we were super, super busy during COVID for sure. That's so wild. So, okay, so working for Home Depot, COVID, it is like major, major, major pivot time. Like I heard, I, I swear, I think I heard the pivot, word pivot more than anything. I should have just tattooed it on my forehead at that point in time. But because it, it feels like that's really what defined the creative industries at that point. So what were you, what were you doing for Home Depot? How were you doing creative campaigns when, I mean, there was a lot of home improvement type stuff going on. It seems like everybody was in this whole phase of let's try to make my house better or even people were building houses. There was a lot of focus really on the home. Did, how did that change what y'all were doing? Yeah. So from my side, we had to pretty much, there was a point where we paused everything. And mm. every single piece of creative had to go back through a review. Because you can imagine we had all kinds of images of people laughing together inside and, like, not yeah. wearing masks. Uh, we yeah. had professionals, like, showing up to people's houses, and we have images of that, and they're not wearing masks. So pretty much every creative that we had that had a human being in it and there was, like, a social group scenario – we had to go back and like mm. figure out how to Photoshop a mask on that person or figure out a new strategy to communicate this project where, you know, maybe before you were calling a professional into your home, but now we need to help you DIY this project. Wow. Um, and so not just creative um, images, but also the content of the campaigns, the strategy behind the campaigns. And so for me, I was primarily um, on the planning side of things so I was trying to get a good sense of you know not just like what can I keep up from my current campaign but how are we gonna completely to your point pivot so that we can you know take action on like everything that's about to happen because we really didn't know what was gonna happen yeah that's that's amazing and so tell me do you do you know off the top of your head how old were you when that was happening oh gosh um math uh <laughs> I know. 20. <laughs> I was uh, 26. Okay, so you're not far removed from college. No, I've been out of college. I graduated in 2016, so it's been seven years for me. So you were having to deal with this major industry worldwide altering event for a major brand. And... You're pretty young. I mean, what what was that like for you? Because I'm thinking about my students and they, you know, a lot of things that I think that they tend to assume is that you have to have a whole bunch of life experience. But at the same time, I feel like they don't always understand their value and their worth being Gen Z. Yeah, and I can completely relate to that because at times I, too, have felt like, lost about am I doing what I want to really be doing or am I just you know learning this skill because it's relevant now I think you can never really know what kind of opportunities are going to come up for you in the future I didn't know that I'd be like you know back in consulting when all that was going down um I think I think the most important thing to remember no matter what age you are is that you have value to add you just have to figure out what that is. So for me, my biggest strengths are definitely on insights and data. I'm a really good at distilling a large amount of data into a very concise insight and a human truth that's going to help not only like push the campaign forward, but push my team forward with a sense of purpose. Mm. And that's really how I came into more of like a leadership role on the team, not because of like my age or my years of experience, but because I was able to give everyone around me kind of like a unified sense of purpose for the work. And I think that really made a difference, especially when, you know, like we're, we're trying to react to new data, new insights constantly having someone who kind of filters that for everybody else and like 
gives it to them in a in a way that they can understand. It, it's a really valuable skill. So if you're if you're good with data, if you're good with people, um, you can really still make a difference by being a leader, even if you're not in like a quote unquote like leadership position. Yeah. So when, so when you say you know, especially when it comes to relating to people. What does that look like? Like, what, what, so what, what kind of actions are you taking? Like, let's say just a day in the life type of moment. How are what kind of tactics are you taking to make sure that you're relating to your team? Yeah. So when I start every single project, I make a stakeholder map. I really take a lot of time to consider for each person how much I should be communicating with them and what types of communications they value most. So let's say I'm working with a data scientist. I know that they really want clear business objectives. They want to know what the outcome is that they need to generate because they're working with AI and machine learning models and all this stuff. Like I can't tell them how to build a machine learning model, but I can tell them the outcome that they need to Mm -hmm. produce. And then I can validate their work based on like that outcome that I'm trying to achieve. It's different though, when you're working with a creative team, because you have to be a lot more explicit about what you do and do not want. (laughs) Um, You have to really clearly outline the guardrails of everything so that you don't end up with something that you can't use. Right. Yeah. No, that makes perfect sense. (laughs) Yes, yeah, I'm sure you know that. So, <laughs> so yeah, like it's it's it really depends on the person and knowing them, knowing their role, um, and that can be challenging, right? When you're first starting out, you don't know, you don't even know what B two B is, you don't even know what a SKU is, like you don't know what any of these acronyms mean that everyone's kind of throwing at you. But if you really listen to people and what they speak up about in meetings, the questions that they ask, you take notes about those people. Mm. I I will shamelessly admit I have a one note file that is full of people and I take notes when I have one on one meetings with them that I can refer back to later that say, hey, this person prioritizes like email. They want to see like a summary report email. And if I'm reaching out to them, you know, that's how they prefer to communicate and, yeah. and and really like keeping these notes has helped me because it's hard to remember. Yeah. You know, on the fly. Yeah. No, I love that. I feel like that's something that, um, I tried to convey in one of my last classes last semester and probably didn't do a very good job on my end of trying to convey that because there's there's only so much you can learn in a semester, especially when it comes to team building and, and that type of thing. Um, so, you know, and, and kind of on that, you know, note about team building, I, I find that a lot of students really do not care for team projects in classes. If you were to reflect back on college and compare it to what you're doing now, how valuable, like, do you think team projects are valuable to, you know, does that kind of thing help you? I don't have any work now that's not a team project. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that ex- so that answers that. that. Yeah, I felt the same way when I was in college. I was like, I can't wait until I get out of this school <laughs> and I don't have to do these group projects with people who continuously let me down or people who just have irrational expectations or people who just ghost me. And guess what? All those same people exist on the other side of the graduation. They're the same people that you're going to be collaborating with. Yeah. Um, And especially for roles that are in media or in marketing, um, even in consulting, you are a cross-functional player. You cannot do your work in a silo. It would be so great if you could. Honestly, I would love that if I could just sit in front of my computer and never talk to a single human being. But they would never let that happen. Everyone has to approve something Mm -hmm. or give feedback on it. People need to be involved. They need to be informed. Um, and I, I have yet to have a single project out in my professional career where I have not worked with a team and where I have worked with a team that had challenges. Yeah. So, OK, so for one, thank you for validating that for me. I really appreciate it. Um, and no, that was not rehearsed for anybody who I swear I'm going to have a student who's gonna be like, she just talked about that beforehand. No, we didn't. Um, but also, OK, so thinking back to when you do have those challenges, because th- that is a I mean, that's a fairly consistent complaint, I think. And I had the same complaint when I was in college. I hated those group projects because somebody always drops the ball. It's just it happens 
no matter what, every single time. And I think that's one of the biggest lessons I try to teach is for one, I'm not going to punish students when somebody else drops the ball, but also you have to communicate and figure out how to move forward. So when, so now in your professional life, when you're on the other side of it and, you know, an A or a B is not at stake, but your paycheck is at stake and what your boss wants you to do is at stake. It's, it's a different kind of weight. How do you approach that? Yeah, I think the biggest learning for me, I definitely made some fumbles on this early in my career, is not being so reactive Mm. to other people's behavior. So it's really easy to get, you know, ticked off when people don't do what they want to do. And the the first reaction that most people have is they want to, like, tell that person they're not doing what they need to do. Um, And what I've found as I've, like, matured in my career and as I've had to deal with, you know, increasingly difficult situations is taking a step back, you know, really listening to what other people are saying is so important because if they don't feel heard, there's not going to be a way for you to move forward. Even if you completely disagree with this person, even if something they're saying is totally irrational, fighting back is never going to produce the outcome that you want to create yeah. like you're not gonna bring them on board by taking them down a notch right yeah um so for me like I really have to take a walk like if I feel my blood pressure rising I take a walk and I try to really consider what the person is trying to communicate to me and look at it from only their perspective not my perspective at all but if I was this person like what are they really asking me for and a lot of times they're just you know, maybe they have an idea and and they just want to have their idea heard. And you can say, all right, great. This group, um, you guys have heard the idea. Like, what does the whole group think? And and don't be afraid to kind of, you know, diffuse the situation by asking for multiple perspectives from everybody and not just, you know, providing your own, like, this is the way it's going to go. You didn't listen to what I, I told you to do, you know, like really just give that person a chance to be heard by everyone and then let the whole group kind of make a decision because people really kind of respond more to group dynamics than they do to the individual feedback. Mm-hmm. So if you can get a whole room of people together who kind of, you know, make the final decision, it feels more permanent than kind of like those one on one reactive interactions that don't really go anywhere. That yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. So kind of on the flip side, but in that same vein, have you ever had a moment where you've had somebody on your team who just does not communicate and almost ghost you? And I would imagine that was probably if, it, if that happened to you, I'd imagine it probably happened more during COVID because, you know, it's so easy to be disconnected. But how do you approach that, especially yeah. if they're not in the same room with you? I would say, you know. I don't think it's as common, like, in professional worlds, like, you know, because you can always ping that person's manager and say, mm-hmm. hey, you know, I sent this request, haven't heard back, just wanted to check in, you know, uh, and there's a lot of, like, escalation paths when you're mm-hmm. working in this corporate environment. Like, you're not totally on your own to try to figure it out with this person, kind of the way you are in a group project. Like, your professor's not going to help you. But <laughs> if that person has a manager then that manager's job is to make sure the people on their team are doing what they need to do. So sometimes like I would just, I would either go to the manager directly if I had that kind of relationship with them, or I would go to my own manager and say, Hey, I've sent this request. Haven't heard that. Would you mind following up with this person's manager and just make sure that's getting done or not, you know, just let me know. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I don't think I really deal with ghosting a lot. I'd say sometimes it happens, but you know, there's, there's ways to get around it. Like it can't, it can't last forever. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's very true. So going back to, I'm going to say Home Depot, just because I think that's the most recognizable brand that I think students are going to know. Is there a campaign or project that you can think back on that you are most proud of and excited about? And and tell me what all went into that, especially on the planning side of things. Yeah, so my favorite thing that I did at Home Depot was a weather-driven campaign. Because, yeah, so this was not something that was, like, really on the shelf to pull off from a social media platform. Like, you can't go on Facebook and say, I only want to show pictures of gardening activities when it's sunny outside. Mm -hmm. Or I only want to show pictures of... Um, weather resistant tarps when it's raining Um, and you can on uh, search like paid search but you can't do this on like social media platforms Mm -hmm. but I was I had this like breakthrough moment as I was doing a customer journey mapping exercise for a um, 
lawn and garden project. And I have to say, like, if there's anything that I would hope your students would take away is like, take a look at customer journey mapping yeah. and how it could, could really help you like get the insights that you need to make a really great campaign. Because when you take a step back and look at everything end to end that a customer has to go through, going back and forth to the store five times, planning the perfect day to get the project done, like they're waiting for that perfect sunny weekend to come. Um, but they're actually not even going to be able to start the project until then. You know, mm-hmm. how do we help them time this up in almost this serendipitous way where they see this ad and then they know it's going to be a beautiful weekend and then they're able to convert in the store that weekend? That's one of the hardest things to do yeah. with marketing is like really get close to the, the path to conversion, right? Yeah. So I had this breakthrough moment. I, I realized it was a limitation on our platforms, but I was working with this really amazing data science team at the time. So I said to them, like, let's figure out how we can be almost like meteorologists inside of Home Depot. Let's get the data. Let's get some people from the Weather Channel in here. Wow. Let's let's figure it out. Um, And and it ended up being that we created this um, weather API that provides weather data based on the customer's profile information. And so now not only can you target ads based on the predictive weather for that customer, uh, it can also be used for things like supply chain management, where if you know that a hurricane is coming, you can stock the store. Mm-hmm. Or if you know that it's going to be kind of a you know bust season for plants, you can plan ahead for that. So is that something that you learned a whole lot about while you were in college um, or because we'd actually we've never talked about customer mapping necessarily on my end of things that they probably talk about that more in the, in the marketing side. But so is this an idea that you had in in college? Like, did you all talk about that in your classes or was this something that it was more hands on? I have this idea. Let's figure out how to do it while we're here at the in, you know in the store. So I learned this when I was working at the first consulting company. This was a big offering that they had for their clients where they would come in and conduct these workshops where Mm -hmm. we usually would do them with call center employees because call center employees know everything about the customer. They hear all the pain points. They know every piece of the experience that is broken. And so we would sit down with them and say, okay, let's pretend this customer doesn't have your service at all. Let's map out every single step that it takes for a customer to go from not hearing about you at all to being familiar with your brand to clicking on the site for the first time, the whole sign up process, Mm -hmm. the whole service process. I mean, the entire thing from end to end. And when you do that, it kind of sets you up with a common understanding of the customer because so many people don't know what the customer experience is, yeah. so they can't design for it. Like They, they just kind of sit in a room and brainstorm and come up with ideas, right? But if you take this kind of methodical approach to really understanding like, what is the most critical moment for this customer? Is it when the actual rubber meets the road and they have to go to the store? Or is it, you know, six months ago when they started pinning things on Pinterest thinking Mm -hmm. about their dream kitchen? Um, It all matters. Like, all of those touch points matter. And so that appreciation that I got from doing that in consulting is, is why I decided to apply the same thing with my team at Home Depot. And I found that it was so helpful because when you're working with a data scientist, all they care about is data. When you're yeah. working with a creative person, all they care about is what the ad is going to look like. But you have to, as, as like the business person, as someone who's like leading a strategy, you have to help everybody get on the same page about like why it is we're doing what we're doing and who we're doing it for. Yeah, no, that's that's really that's that's really incredible. What I what I love about all that is how it sounds like you've been able to take everything, you know, your ad sales experience, the creative writing aspect, the customer mapping, working adjacent with data scientists and then, you know, using this really first in a largely it sounds like creative but also planning way for Home Depot, but now you've been able to then take that and move it more into user experience. For Ernest Young, and I, one thing I, I feel like I observe a lot is, like, if I'm on a really bad website, the first thing I say is, oh, my God, they don't have a UX person on staff. They need a UX person. Um, it, it really seems like that user experience is so important, but maybe 
we don't always realize it. It's kind of like, unless you're in the industry and you know that user experience is a field, you may not really be fully aware of it. Yeah, so many teams are not really design-led. They're very business-led, and it, it, it shows, right? And, yeah. and there are different ways that companies approach this, right? Like Figma, as a company, is super design-oriented, and that's been their, like, success in the market. Um, same thing for Google, Airbnb, Apple. Like, these companies that deliver great experiences is because they have great designers. Um, and, and so many companies kind of throw that creative piece out the window and they say like, I'm the business person. I get to decide what this looks like. And they don't go talk to a customer. Um, they don't look at what competitive features are out there. Um, they just, you know, make decisions and move forward. So that's a big part of what I do is like helping the business stakeholders make really informed decisions based on data, based on best practices and looking at competitors and, get, you know, really helping shape their vision for what it could be so that we can deliver something that's awesome and not something that just, you know, reflects what the business says goes, right? Right. Yeah. And that's, of course, where you get your statistics classes and that type of thing and being able to incorporate that in the creative and, and like you kept saying, the design aspect of it, which I think is something that um, I know that we've got a lot of uh, students who have really good like graphic design experience or they love to use Canva and things like that. And, and maybe don't, maybe we don't always talk about, or at least I don't know that I talk about it as much as I should, but really why that design experience is so important. It's not just about being aesthetically pleasing. It's also being user friendly because if they can't if users can't use it if customers can't use it they're going elsewhere absolutely and you know i think what's what helps us have more time for design is being really good planners yeah if we if we really take the time to look at all of our learnings actually look at the data think ahead look at holidays look at seasons mm -hmm. look at industry trends, um, things that you did last year that you definitely want to do again, um, industry, you know, conferences. I mean, anything that you can gather ahead of time is, is going to really set you up for success to have more time to do design. And I will say, like, I'm not a graphic designer by any means, but that is also a really key part of storytelling. Like, yeah. you, you can either be a really great writer and communicate everything with just words, or you can use visuals too. But however you get your storytelling across, um, it's it's super, super important, even if you don't feel like that skill is something that you're going to put out into the, into the world. Mm -hmm. It can still, you know, make a difference of, like, my boss understanding what I'm trying to say or my boss looking at my presentation and saying, I don't know what any of this means. <laughs> Well, and that's something we have a digital humanities thing at Georgia College. And actually, I've been speaking with um, the person who runs it about trying to incorporate that into classes somehow. It's um, a good way to explain it is, I guess, if you ever read like the New York Times and you see the graphics that go alongside the stories to help enhance, you know, the storytelling experience. That's um, kind of what they do. So I think that's a really interesting way to approach that. Um, so one last question before we round up, um, and this is something I tell students, but I also like to ask people this, have you ever encountered a boss or a, you know, somebody you report to who gives you kind of a general vague direction of, I want you to do this, but they don't go into specifics and then they just kind of expect you to go with it. All the time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, all the time. <laughs> Um, and so uh, we, we have a saying at EY that's um, the better the questions, the better the way the world works. Mm, love that. Um, so when someone gives you a vague request, you know, I always enthusiastically accept. Yes, absolutely. I'd love to get that started. I have a few questions before yeah. we do that. Um, and I and I try to maintain in my lovely one note of secret, secret <laughs> people, I try to have like the most common questions that I ask when kicking off different kinds of projects. And typically, you know, it could either be like, hey, let's set up a call and I'll just ask you a couple of questions or I'm going to send these questions over email. As soon as I get your answers, we're going to get started. Um, if I don't want to get started immediately, uh, pro tip, I will ask some really hard questions. <laughs> oh, my God. I'll say, I'll oh. say 
like uh, it has le- I'll say it has legal reviewed this because there you I know people review takes six months. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I, I think it's like you you will always get vague requests, but the due diligence to ask a good question is on you. If you try to sit down in front of your computer and just do it, of course you're going to have a million questions. So just anticipate that and be prepared for your, the first thing to come out of your mouth when someone asks you something vague is to say, I have a few questions about that. Could I get 30 minutes with you next week after I have some time to, you know, take a look at everything and just, you know, after that we can go ahead and get started. Like let them know you're, you're, you're serious about it doing the work that they want you to do and of course they're going to expect that you have questions like executives know like they have to answer questions about things so you know don't be afraid uh, th- thank you for validating uh, every single student. I think their uh, their initial concerns when they have me for a class because I tend to be intentionally vague. And I think until they get to know me, they I, I see a whole lot of um, uh, just mental explosions happening. So, uh, so thank you. I, pre- I appreciate that. Um, thank you really also so much just for talking with us. And I say us, you know, future audience, but, um, you have done so much in really a short amount of time. Wait, how old are you now? I'm 28. So you're, I mean, you're not even 30, you know, you're still really at the beginning of your career, but you have accomplished a lot. I mean, a lot, a lot. And I think that's incredible and is really a good example for students for what they can, what, for what's possible for them. Um, and I love that you keep all these notes. I mean, you're, you're a very, I know this about you because I've known you for a while, but you, you are a very self-driven person. And it sounds to me, at least a lot of your success is not because you were led there, but because you worked to get there. I will say, like, it has not been an easy journey for me. I've had so many times where I just, you know, didn't feel as successful as maybe I was. You know, I think it's hard when you're really deep in the work to have that appreciation for it. Um, And so, you know, I think it's important to remember that everybody feels that way. Even the most successful people in the whole world sometimes feel like they're not doing enough. And so, um, oh, sorry, I got a call. Did we cut out? No, you're fine. Um, so yeah, like even the most successful people in the whole world feel the same way. Like they're not doing enough sometimes or that like what they're doing might lead to something fruitless at the end. Um, you know, we all struggle in our careers. We all take a step back and ask like, is this really what I want to do for the rest of my life? But if you, if you do work hard, you will always like be rewarded for with, you know, opportunities. If you're the type of person who can get things done and listen and get along really well, I mean, those are the basics that it takes to succeed. Everything else you can learn how to do. Yeah, no, that's awesome. So one, one very last question, because students always ask this with guest speakers. Um, do y'all have internships where you work for college students? Yeah, EY does have an internship program. Um, It's very structured. Um, There's a whole application process with like the same deadlines every year. Um, Usually the recruiters are on campus for some schools so you can connect with folks there. I'm not quite sure about you guys, but um, yeah, no, EY absolutely has an internship program. If anyone is interested in that or if, you know, they're interested in making connections at Home Depot or anywhere else that I've worked, I'm always happy to extend my network to everyone. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dylan. I really appreciate this. Of course. Thank you for having me. This is really fun. Today awesome. has been just, you know, a great opportunity for me to reflect on everything, too. I, I really appreciate it. Awesome. I'm going to go ahead and hit stop recording. Special thanks to our guests today, as well as all the sponsors for my content production, Advanced Dental Arts, Katie Berg at Mayo Hill. That would be the baby in the background, El Sombro Restaurant in Forsyth Road in Macon, Georgia, and Triple Dot Social. You can find links to all, ooh, there he goes, all of their websites in the show notes. Be sure to give them a visit as a thank you for their support. And an exciting news about Dylan, she is going to Coca-Cola. She will be there. Oops, let me look at my notes. She will be an end-to-end connections and media manager for Coke. Diet Coke and Coke Zero. Congratulations, Dylan. I am so proud to know you. Show music is Drop the Tapes by Track Tribe from the YouTube Content Creator Studio. And again, 
My name is Molly Wilkins, and I am a lecturer in the Department of Communication at Georgia State, excuse me, Georgia College and State University in beautiful Milledgeville, Georgia. To learn more about me, check out all of my social pages with the handle Love Molly Kate or go to hellomollywilkins.com. Be sure to continue to follow along with us with this inaugural season of We Love the Hype. Yeah, uh oh.